Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. I'm your host, Amelia Thompson, and today's webinar is Impedance Spectra of Different Capacitor Technologies, partnered with DigiKey Electronics, the exclusive sponsor of our Worth Electronic webinars. Joining us back in the studio is Dr. Renee Kalbitz. He's a product manager for our capacitor and resistors division at Worth Electronic. Now, if you have any questions during today's webinar, please feel free to ask them in the questions box and we'll get around to answering them at the end. If your question does not get answered, or if you think of one a little bit later, simply email us at webinarteam at we-online.com. Now, because you registered for today's event, you will automatically receive the presentation slides and the video on demand when they become available. Simply look for the link in your email. As a reminder, our webinars will be taking a brief summer break, but you can still find them in our video center at Worth Electronic Online. And then we will return in September Join us for the Symphony of Oscillators, Harmonizing Signals for Success, and you can register online with our follow-up email or at www.we-online.com slash webinars. And now let's begin today's Worth Electronic webinar with Dr. Renee Kelbitz, Impedance Spectra of Different Capacitor Technologies, partnered with DigiKey Electronics. All right, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, as already uh, um, announced today, I would like to talk about impedance spectra of capacitor technologies and how to interpret them. My name, my name as already mentioned, is René Kalbitz. I'm working in the capacitor department for Worth Electronic. Here, I'm responsible for the supercapacitors and capacitor-related research projects. There is a manifold of capacitor technologies. Each have their specific charge storage process. Just to give you some examples, polymer electronic capacitors utilize the large polarizability of conductive polymers, the mechanism of electrical conductivity of conducting polymers is based on the transmission of so-called polarons. For supercapacitors, two charge storage mechanisms need to be considered, Faradaic charge storage as well as non-Faradaic for electric double air capacitors, which is the most relevant group of supercapacitors. Charges are stored at the interface uh, in a so-called Helmholtz plane in a non-Faradaic process. Ceramic capacitors make use of a charge displacement within the unit cell of the lattice structure of the ceramic, which in some cases may even depend on the applied DC voltage. Here we see impedance and normalized capacitance spectra, which are typical for EDLCs, that is supercapacitor, electrolytic capacitors, as well as multi-layer ceramic capacitors or MLCC. Without going too much into detail, due to the use technology and processes, each spectrum has its own characteristic and it's um, lo and is located at different frequencies, as you can see. Um, especially the capacitance spectra uh, looks quite different for each technology. For all measurements, it is required to have a model in order to interpret the measurement results. It is common practice to use equivalent circuits for the interpretation of um, capacitance spectra. Here you may see a few examples that can be used to interpret, for instance, supercapacitors, MLCCs, or ECAPs, and many more. The circuits model, um, so-called the bipolarization, um, the polarizations at the interface, and so on. It is, at this point, no use to get too much into detail. I just wanted to show you these circuits to point out the complexity 
um, of capacitive charge storage if it comes to modeling. However, for electrical engineering, the data interpretation and the modeling can be much simplified. We are lucky. We mostly need one single model. With that single model, it is possible to retrieve the electrical parameters of practically all capacitors on the market. I mean, there are a few um, examples where you can cannot use it, but most of the time you are well served with this single model. In the course of the talk, I will explain how to use the model for the interpretation of the spectra. We will have a look at spectra for high and low capacitive parts and discuss the issue of loss angle accuracy and the ESR measurement. You may use a simple capacitor sign in your circuit diagram. However, the actual circuit, as used for instance in LT SPI simulation, is the circuit just below. Let's have a closer look at the model. The model consists of an ideal capacitor CS, an ohmic equivalent series resistance named RESR. The ESR models all energy dissipative processes that restricts charge movement. In real life, it depends on temperature, frequency, and other parameters, but in most cases, the, ohm, the ohmic behavior is um, sufficiently good for, for the description of the spectra and uh, to understand them. So this resistance here is responsible for the fact that our parts sometimes get warm. Also, the leakage current uh, is modeled um, as an ohmic resistance, but with, with a much higher resistivity. Um, it is called in this um, graph here, R leak, which in most cases can be even neglected because it is um, high ohmic. Since all capacitors are connected by metal leads, and um, current collectors, we also have to consider a small inductance, the equivalent series inductance called LESL. The ESL is, however, not a design parameter. It is due to metal leads, metal traces, um, and metal current collectors, and so on. And um, yeah, depending on the exact PCB layout, it may vary from application to application. The equivalent circuit is merely a representation that helps visually. One and one may discuss certain behavior qualitatively pretty good with this one already. More important, however, is the mathematical representation since this one is ultimately used to extract values from measurements or it is used for the simulations. Again, we do not need to discuss the formula at this point. I just want to show you that it is a function with a real and imaginary part that consists or that contains all the elements or parameters of the equivalent circuit, which I have just discussed. So you will find all the values which are here are somehow also um, modeled here. The model can also be translated into a vector representation where the abscissa represents the real values and the ordinate represents the imaginary values. So the inductive and capacitive reactants um, uh, relate to the ordinate and the resistance, like the ESR to the abscissa. The vector representation is very useful to illustrate the relations between each component. Important for the accuracy of the measurement is the loss angle, for instance. 
denoted as delta here in the vector representation. And we will talk about this later in, in, the, in this talk. Um, here is an example. We see a fit um, of this model to a group of MACC impedance spectra. It illustrates the influence of the capacitance variation on the position of the impedance curve. And I, I just wanted to give you a, yeah, uh, an argument that you really trust me, okay, if you can model this with this, it is a good model. Um, as a matter of fact, the capacitor can act as a capacitor, as resistor, as inductor, or as a resonator. It all depends on the frequency. There are several characteristic frequencies that determine which parts or units of the circuit is active. At those characteristic frequencies, the spectra show specific features, as we will see later. Each characteristic frequency is related to the interaction of two components usually, for instance. At low frequency, the pure capacitance couples with a leakage resistance forming the characteristic frequency of the C R leak unit or denoted F leak. In the mid and high frequency range, the capacitance may couple either with the ESR or with the parasitic inductance. Um, forming the FRC or FLC frequency. Also at high frequencies, the ESR can couple with a parasitic inductance and that usually happens at the frequency I denote as FRL. Before we go to the measurements, let's have a closer look at the impedance spectra calculated by the model. The advantage of the theoretical graph is I can show the behavior of the entire spectra over a wide frequency range and discuss all features very nicely. Here I have calculated the spectra uh, with values based on a, on a film capacitor with a, with a capacitance of 4.7 microfarads. It may serve as an example for low capacitive parts. How can we interpret uh, the spectra and what data can be extracted? The most important feature in this graph is the minimum at the characteristic frequency of the LC unit. At this frequency, the spectrum has a sharp minimum. The position is determined by the capacitance and the parasitic inductance. The ESR measurement is most accurate around this region. The minimum value of um, the impedance is actually the ESR at this specific frequency. Towards higher frequency, we see an increase of impedance. In this region, the spectrum is dominated by the parasitic inductance. Thus, it acts as an as a inductor. Towards lower frequencies, the impedance increases as well. However, this part of the spectrum is dominated by the pure capacitance. At um, very low frequencies, usually well below one hertz, the impedance curve shows a shoulder, which is situated at the characteristic frequency of the um, CR leak unit or F leak. At this point, the capacitor acts as high ohmic resistor. Thus, below this uh, frequency, the leakage resistance um, can be simply read off, can be inferred from, from the graph. Maybe I should say could be inferred since you may see it only for a very leaky capacitor or if you would measure towards very low frequencies, 
which you cannot do with um, uh, yeah with with any equipment. Uh, you need a special impedance analyzer, but you can measure it nonetheless. The spectrum here is calculated such as um, to fit values from a 50 farad uh, supercapacitor. It may serve as an example for high capacitive parts. Let's start with the most important frequency range between um, uh, uh, one um, one hertz uh, and one megahertz. High capacitive parts show a bathtub-like shape and not a sharp minimum as shown before. The bottom of the graph, however, is centered around the characteristic frequency of the LC unit. The entire bottom region is dominated by the ESR. So in this area, the ESR can be extracted with high accuracy or basically read off directly from the graph. The onset of the capacitive parts towards lower frequencies is at the characteristic frequency of the RC unit, FRC here. Below that frequency, the capacitor is dominated by the capacitive part and actually starts to act as an capacitor. Above the characteristic frequency of the RL unit that is here, the capacitor starts to act as an inductor. The frequencies um, around here of 10 to minus 10 to 10 to minus 12 are incredibly low and nearly impossible to measure, even with the right equipment, it would take ages. However, I wanted to have to have it just for the sake of uh, completeness and for yeah educational reasons that you really see. Okay, here we have this behavior, which I have shown before as well. So we can also see the influence of the leakage current uh, in such cases. Also interesting for the device, characterization are capacitance spectra as, as shown here. The two depicted capacitance spectra are again for the 50 farad supercapacitor and the 4.7 microfarad film capacitor. The graphs are representatives again for high and low capacitive parts. The orange uh, graph for the supercapacitor shows the shoulder at, at the characteristic uh, frequency F um, RC. This is a typical behavior for large capacitors. All large capacitors, if you like, show this type of shoulder. The height of the shoulder gives the capacitance of the part. Above this frequency, the capacitance in the spectra goes towards zero. Hence, above that frequency, the capacitor cannot be fully charged anymore. The spectrum of the um, 4.7 microfarad capacitor looks quite different, as you can see. That is what typically capacitance spectra of low capacitive parts look like. At low frequencies, <coughs> they show a clear capacitive behavior. Um, the most striking feature, however, is the strong asymptotic behavior at the characteristic LC frequency. At this point, capacitance and parasitic inductance leads to a resonating behavior and above the characteristic LC frequency, the capacitance again actually tends towards zero, meaning the capacitor cannot be charged anymore. So what is something you have to keep in mind or you should keep in mind? No matter what the actual capacitor technology um, you consider, it's mainly its capacitance value that will determine the overall appearance of the spectrum. To demonstrate that, I have um, prepared an animation. I hope I can start this one. The only thing I 
change here is the capacitance. I go from high to low capacitance, and as you can see, um, the shoulder changes gradually from this yeah, shoulder to, to this spiky asymptotic behavior. And all I'm doing is, is changing the capacitance. <clears throat> So enough of the theoretical graphs and consideration. Let's have a look at the measured spectra of a 50 farad supercap. It may serve, again, as already mentioned, as an example for high capacitive parts. The impedance spectrum shows, as in the calculations before, a bathtub-like uh, laser pointer. Here we have it, laser pointer. Um, a bathtub-like uh, progression, as can be seen on the top left graph here. This flat bottom region, region um, represents pretty much the ESR of, ESR of the supercap. As you can see, the curve progression compares to the ESR plot below. That is the real part um, of the impedance that is practically in our model, the ESR. It has a slight increase towards lower frequencies. At high and low frequencies, the measurement accuracy of the loss angle prevents the correct separation of the capacitive reactants and the inductive reactants from the ESR. So that is around here and around here. This leads to a steep increase um, <coughs> um, at high um, frequencies and a steep um, yeah, decrease at low frequencies um, at the corresponding characteristic frequencies. So the measurement of the ESR is most accurate between the characteristic frequency of the RC and the RL unit. The capacitance spectrum on the right-hand side shows the typical shoulder situated at the characteristic frequency of the RC unit at FRC. The height of the shoulder gives the um, capacitance of the device, in this case, around 50 farads. <clears throat> As a representation for a low capacitive part, I would like to show you the spectra of the 407 a 470 nanofarad film capacitor, the impedance spectra looks quite different from the one before. It has a sharp minimum at the characteristic frequency um, of the LC unit. As you know from the um, theoretical graphs, the minimum value is the ESR at the specific frequency. The ESR spectrum is largely influenced by the capacitive and the inductive uh, reactants. It often does not reflect the actual ESR. Um, I will come to this um, later and uh, elaborate on, on that a bit more. Most trustworthy are the results around the characteristic um, frequency FRC towards higher and lower, lower frequencies, uh, it will be difficult for the impedance spectrometer, uh, spectrometer to separate the imaginary from the real part. This usually leads to some kind of U-shaped spectrum with a local minimum around the characteristic LC frequency. The capacitance spectrum does not have a shoulder, anymore. It will show this asymptotic behavior. This is actually a physically correct behavior, not just some artifact. The capacitance and the inductance constitute a resonating system leading to this Lorentz, uh, Lorentz oscillation. For the developer, that means you stay away from that frequency. The capacitor can only be used below this frequency uh, of the LC unit. In, in this region, 
Um, the capacitance can then also be inferred from the spectrum. In this case, uh, it's a bit higher than the rated one. It's 495 nanofarads. I have mentioned before that the ESR at uh, the low and high frequency cannot be measured correctly. I want to, de I want to discuss that uh, on the example of um, low capacitive part. For frequencies well above the characteristic frequency, also below, um, the loss angle tends towards zero. As you can see here, you have a sharp rise um, of the loss angle at FLC, but if you go away, uh, from or further away from this frequency, it tends towards zero. Um, however, the device is only, the measurement device um, is only able to measure values above the accuracy limit. It cannot go to, to zero. Delta or tangents delta becomes a constant, therefore, it cannot go below its accuracy. Um, thus, at some point, the real and imaginary part is not properly separated and the ESR becomes practically proportional to the capacitive or inductive reactance. This is all due to the resolution limit. Let's exemplify the meta on spectra of an ECAP. The left graph shows the imaginary part, which is red, um, and the real part of the impedance. So red is the imaginary part of the impedance, and um, the blue is the real part. And what we also see is a fit um, of a model that describes the ESR. Usually, um, it has become established to use a law that is called Yonsha Power Law. Um, practically all ESR models are based on power laws, um, but I don't want to go too much um, into details at this point. Um, but it is common practice to model ESR behavior with power law based models. Details are found um, in the literature and um, are given also on the slide. Um, if you use such a model, then it is able to describe the region below, let's say one kilohertz quite well. However, as the frequencies goes um, below, let's say 100 hertz or so, the uh, function strongly deviates from the measurement. This is around the frequency range when the loss angle gets close to its measurement accuracy, as you can see on this graph. At lower frequencies, the graph of the ESR runs then parallel to the graph of the imaginary part. I don't want to bother you with logarithmic law, but if you do the math, you will see that the propor proportionality will lead, um, the proportionality you, you have here will lead um, to a shift in the double logarithmic plot. I hope this will convince you that for low frequencies, the ESR spectrum does not actually show the ESR, ESR ESR, but is influenced by the capacitive reactance. Um, and um, I, I may may have should uh, pointed out some uh, um, this detail here um, more in, in more detail. Um, this angle here, this is around the accuracy limit, of, uh, accuracy limit of the device, which I'm using um, to actually measure this graph. So as a rule of thumb, you can keep in mind, only use um, ESL values extracted 
around the minimum of the impedance or at, at the bottom of the impedance. The lower you get, the more likely it is that the ESR is overestimated. If you want to be really sure, you always have to look at the loss angle and have to search the manual for the accuracy limit of the device. And then you know exactly what values you can trust and um, where you, you start to overestimate your ESR. So the loss angle is essential if you want to make the knowledge about the loss angle is essential if you want to make um, an accurate interpretation of the data. Does that mean that if the ESR increases, that it is always due to the increase of the imaginary part of the impedance? Well, hard to say, as long as the tangents delta cannot be measured accurately. Um, if you don't have any information about that and you see these very strong increase, it is very likely that the ESR is largely overestimated and you should start to be very suspicious about the values. Which brings me to the conclusion. What should you take home? For electrical engineering, only one model is required to describe all capacitors. It is a simplification, yes, but it is accurate enough. It describes all measured features. Also, it is the, mo it is the loss angle resolution that limits the accuracy of the ESR measurements. You should only trust values at the frequency range where the impedance shows a minimum, the lower, um, uh, the lower the frequency, the less accurate the ESR measurements actually. The capacitance value, on the other hand, is best extracted at the low frequency and well below the characteristic uh, RC or LC frequency. Well, thank you for your attention. Um, I think we have some time now to to answer all your questions. Yes, thank you, Renee. We do have some questions rolling on in. And again, if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the questions box. Our first question, um, at the beginning of the presentation, you mm. showed several other equivalent circuits. Can you please mm. give an example when you would use one of those instead of the ones that you've just talked about? Yeah, for instance, um, if you want to go to very high frequencies, um, let's say above one megahertz or so, then it, for instance, might be necessary to um, to, to use a Debye-like model, which places a high frequency capacitance in parallel to your um, RC unit. Um, with that, you can then also start to model the high frequency part. Um, the model I just have discussed is in itself a, a simplification, but it is a very good and reasonable simplification, um, which allows us to extract the most important parameters. Um, it will never be able to like model all details to 100% accuracy. For instance, if you go to um, um, to the capacitance spectra of the um, 50 farad capacitor, then you see that um, above the shoulder here, you still have an increase of the capacitance. It is not something that the calculation has shown. And this is because um, I didn't model the surface area quite properly. Uh, I just use one single capacitance. What I actually always should use for ECAPs or, or supercapacitors is something like this, like a distribution of an RC network. But nobody does that, actually. It is too too complicated. You cannot like put it in, in a data sheet. Um, but um, those are the situations where you would tend to different models and um, yeah, to uh, use more elaborate models than, than the one I've shown here. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, our second question, 
the capacitance spectrum on slide 16, this has a somewhat strange uh, asymptotic behavior. It has this large peak and it even has some negative values. How can you explain this? This is really like a, a physical behavior of this system. The capacitance is a measure how good per voltage increase um, charges can be stored, or more precisely, how more precisely how many charge or how much energy I can store per um, voltage increase, and it actually means that close to this frequency, I could theoretically put much more energy um, into this capacitive system um, as it would have. In, in the lower frequency region where you should run it. Um, but at a very sharp point, and this will be a very uh, volatile point, this whole system then flips to, um, to negative values. And that also means that you're kind of out of phase with your excitation voltage. So um, the system, the RC, um, the the LC unit resonates at a specific frequency, um, as so to speak, and and then now you superimpose it with your with your voltage signal at, at which you actually want to charge and discharge your capacitor. But the system is not responding to that. And actually, every time you want to add a little charge by increasing the voltage a little bit, the system is out of phase and actually discharges and therefore you get these negative capacitances that means your system is like losing energy when it shouldn't so it's um it's a behavior of a, of a resonator you always get a capacitance or behavior like this if you have a resonator so you I stay away it. from it i mean you, you cannot utilize this area in any way because you just shift the um the inductance by some tiny bit due to some temperature or something, you you jump from here to here and um, it's it's your your layout won't work anymore. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, our next question: Are supercapacitors polarized? Are they closer to film or electrolytic capacitors? Uh, they are they are they are in symmetric in structure. And they usually EDLC um, has an activated carbon layer on both sides. So theoretically, uh, it's a bipolar device. However, due to some chemical reactions, one part of the electrode always degrades a bit faster than the other. So in production, um, they um, tackle that by making one layer a bit thicker than the other. So therefore, um, the actual bipolar device becomes unipolar. But it doesn't mean um, that that it gets destroyed um, immediately if if you um, uh, charge it with uh, reverse polarization, if a bit like like with negative charge. Um, you shouldn't do that. Um, the, we only guarantee the lifetime for if as as you use it as a unipolar device. Um, but yeah, you can actually also charge it to negative voltages if it once if it happens once, um, it's not so bad. Uh, but in a regular layout, it you should always take care that it only sees positive voltages. I hope that answers the question Thank otherwise you, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't need any pre-polling or something no. absolutely and if the question is uh, a little fuzzy or if we have any questions later please feel free to either ask them during this presentation or you can also contact us at webinar team at we-online.com so we have a couple more questions here for power loss calculations, I need ESR values below the resonance frequency. Which values should I use? Yeah, 
uh, it's a bit tricky. I mean, usually you can't do much. Um, uh, it's, I mean, it would be, it's, it's a very technical question, would be best answered uh, maybe later or if, if you could write an email. But um, there is a slight increase usually. I mean, I have shown, um, for instance, the Yonsha power law. So usually you can assume some, some values that are reasonable based uh, on the literature. So you know that it will increase about a factor something. So um, you are not totally lost, but certainly, um, well, it, uh, it's difficult to, to measure it. I mean, one would have to look at the details, um, what means low frequency and like what frequency actually, are we actually talking about? Maybe we have a chance by measuring um, um, in a, configuration where you um, measure the, the voltage drop over the device and, and the applied current separately. But yeah, that's that's all I can say at this point. You have to assume that it is a bit higher than, than the one you have in, in the data sheet then. You should safely assume that it is a bit higher. Yes, sometimes there is not a uh, one size fits all answer, but of course, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to uh, the doctor here or any of our spectacular product managers with our capacitors and resistors division. Our next question, we ha have time for a couple more. Uh, how mm -hmm. can I increase the bandwidth of a film capacitor in a DC application for filtering high frequency ripples? And they mean that if the film capacitor changes from capacitor to inductor at 70 kilohertz, using ceramic capacitors can increase the bandwidth? Um, too much detail. Um, honestly, I would rather um, answer this this question by, by mail as well, because it's, it's uh, too much detail, too much, uh, um, yeah, um, questions I would have to ask back. Um, so, Yes, from, from what you say, that might be a strategy, but as, as I said, um, before um, I, I give you an answer that is half as good as it should be, it's, it's better to, um, yeah, to have a conversation about that later. I think that's an excellent idea. And to the uh, attendee who did ask the question, we will be reaching out to you after the webinar yeah. today. Uh, our final question here. Um, if my system has frequency characteristics at or above the resonant frequency of a particular capacitor, is there a means of dealing with that, like adding a smaller ceramic capacitor? Uh, yeah, well, if, if you do just add it, you, you change the overall capacitance of your system. So it's not just like that you add a capacitance and then then you somehow shift that asymptotic behavior or that shoulder by some value. It's not going to work. You also then implicitly change the capacitance of the overall system. Um, so it will not be possible to to go so easily um, around that. But the only thing, if you if you don't want to operate um, your capacitor at this uh, specific frequency, um, you would have to use a capacitor with a different capacitance. That's the only, um, yeah, the, the only thing um, I, I can think about right right now, what that means uh, for, for the um, specific applications, I cannot say. Um, again, that is a rather detailed question. Um, maybe it's worthwhile to discuss it later by mail or or separately by telephone call. But it's not just adding something and you then you shift it. It's not that easy. Thank you very much for your descriptions and for answering the questions. Uh, Dr. Kalbitz, thank you for presenting today's webinar. I thank you too, and um, I wish you a good day.
And Bye -bye. thank you everybody for joining us for today's uh, presentation. If you have any questions following today's webinar, or if you need a little bit more clarification, please respond back to our follow-up email. That's webinarteam at we-online.com. And don't forget to follow Worth Electronic or myself on LinkedIn for all of our upcoming webinars. You can also hear this webinar and others in our podcast. You can listen into the Worth Electronic What's Up radio podcast, where each week we are bringing application notes, blogs, press releases, and our webinars to an audio and video format. And a new episode launches every other Thursday at 6 p.m. Central. That is the What's Up podcast can be found on all podcast streaming networks, including iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and so much more. Now, as a reminder, our webinars are taking a summer break, but we will return in September as we present the Symphony of Oscillators, Harmonizing Signals for Success. Register online at www.we-online.com slash webinars. I'm Amelia Thompson, and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.